I think why I always like won these rider polls or like fan favorite things in the past was like, I didn't come up in skiing through like the contest. I wasn't like the kid that like did events, grew up like out West in a program and like seemed privileged. Like I came from the East coast. I grew up making videos. My story was relatable to a lot of the ski fans out there, I think. And then for some reason, people just like relate to that. I think they, they love to see like, not to say I was an underdog, but they love to see someone like more like themselves, like seeing somebody come up from a small resort and then make it through this and into the X games. Finally, after like years of having cool videos, it seemed like a more approachable, like way to get into skiing or into like the top level events. And I don't know, it resonated with people. Unleashed with the Dingo and Danny, fueled by Monster Energy. Hey, Tom. <laughs> we hey. back. <laughs> we back. We back. What's up, guys? We uh, we uh, we're learning. We're new to this like world, so this is the first time we're using um. Ding don't mics. do that, Dingo. No, I know. I'm just like I'm showing you that. Okay. Like, are you my audio guy? He's my audio guy. Well, the audio guy's right over there, I think. At the back behind here. I thought they were over there. Oh, they're over there. Tom, I'm sorry that we uh, we we pulled you out of the mountains. It's all good. I needed a break from the mountains. It's finally snowing, so uh, it's time for a day off. I'm happy to be here with you guys. It's your first time to the office. My first time to headquarters out here. You've never been here. I don't know why. And we took you out in the middle of the mm -hmm. winter, or snowing. Where'd you come from? Uh, Park City, Utah. That's where you live, right? Yep. Yeah, I've just been at home. It's been dumping, so we've been riding resorts, uh, skiing, pal, having fun. It finally, it's winter time. Yeah, Danny's in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, over in Vail, and we've just been getting dumped on over the last two weeks. Been sick. And one thing that's really cool about the mountain life is definitely it's like that bubble. You don't really feel the COVID vibe as much. It doesn't feel as shut down. I live in Los Angeles. I feel the COVID bubble every <laughs> single day of my life. You do, huh? Yeah, that's why I stayed an extra like week and a half at, in Aspen after X Games. I was like, why would I go home? <laughs> <laughs> but like skiing and snowboarding are pretty nice because you are you're already wearing goggles, a face mask. I always am covered up, gloves. Like I love that at least we're we're clear to do that. It's like the the one outdoor activity I feel like that's really going right now. So very fortunate for us. I just worry about all the kids licking the uh, <laughs> chairlifts. Yeah, or I'm the, like I just gotta remember not to lick the chairlifts anymore because that was a big. You problem. normally do that? Yeah, it's something I've been doing since I was a kid. You know. Mm -hmm. you but know? now you got the mask, so you're protected from it. That's true. I can't get my tongue out. I'm like, it's weird. I was pretty surprised, like going from always wearing the masks and then the COVID hit. And I was like, this should be super mellow. Like I'll be able to keep it up on the mountain all the time. But I am, I'm getting yelled at quite a bit for, I'm a nose. Sometimes the nose will poke out. Mm. See, my biggest thankfulness for the mask is it forces you to cover your nose and you always get like red nose all winter from sun and wind burn. Mm. So my nose, I haven't been looking as Rudolph, Rudolphy as normal, which I think is in a plus. Yeah, the goggle tan, the classic like goggle tan you get to show people that like, whoa, that's a real mountain man, you know, like <laughs> that guy's out there. Showing off the goggle tan. We were all at X Games. X Games was pretty stressful to make that happen, eh? Yeah, at least they did though. I mean, it was weird this year though. No fans, so no one in the crowd. I mean, that's what like makes X Games what it is, is like everybody watching, but at least they got it off. I don't know about snowboarding, but like we haven't had any events for skiing, like anything happening. So it was so nice to see, like let all the boys and girls go out and, and throw down for a change. I, I heard X Games actually made a lot of money this year because they didn't sell any of the tickets to the concerts and there wasn't any of the spectators. So I guess their fans only was like blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> get it fans only is that is that your that was that was my joke Danny okay. con Danny's okay. contemplating on signing up for only fans so he's only like, fans that's only it. Fans. Yeah. that's did why you I mess, did. did you mess the only yeah. joke up you brought to I, the table yeah I that's why i didn't get it right away i was only like, joke 
it was kind of funny that like well it's not funny man uh, honestly kudos to espn disney x games for letting that happen that was really mm -hmm. cool to make that happen because to your point tom like you know there hasn't been many competitions a few snowball competitions they got locks off danny made it mm -hmm. over there for that and then uh yeah it's kind of like bottom of the barrel you know like it's it's but i thought the uh the 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 strangest part not the strangest part but like the most nervous part, you know, obviously there was a lot of testing that went down, oh, yeah. but when you arrived and then there was the bullpen, but you had to walk back to where the backstage of the, the, the artist area would usually be. And it was, it was, there was an area where you put your bags and then you had to stand outside in the snow. And then there was a room where only one person was allowed at a time. They test you and they were rapid tests. So like 20, 30 minute tests. And then they would stick you back outside in like a, what I called the bullpen. Oh yeah. Right. And the bullpen, the bullpen was the most nervous part because you got tested. You're now standing out there with people, other people in the bullpen and everyone's kind of like looking around, like, you know, it's like, who's got it. And then there's the secondary booth, which was like the, the prison basically, which where you got taken if you got secondary. Right. And one of the times I'm sitting there, I'm it's, it's my second test, you know? So it's, it's where I'm, we're halfway through. And at this point, if you're testing positive, you've definitely got other people sick. Right. Oh. That's a fact. That's a fact. So I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for my result to come in. There were three or four people ahead of me and then two guys had come out and then a guy before me left. And I was like, this isn't good. And then another guy got called in and he was taught, he, he knew a lady that was in there. And she's like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I'm coming to secondary. Somebody's, there's somebody's tested blood. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. Oh man, it's me. He opens up the, you know, the, 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 the prison cell. It kind of looked like it was like the secondary ca cabin, you know, it was like, there was the trailer and then like half a trailer. It was oh, just yeah. like, looked like a metal prison door opens. And it was a good five minutes go by and the lady comes out and I'm like, oh, I'm so done right now. And she gives me my little ticket that says I'm verified to go in. But I literally was right behind somebody that got sent into secondary, which was a scary, stressful, it was a scary thing. The bullpen. I like that. Like, you you're, like the you're just like stuck in there and you're like, oh man, I hope I make it into the event. Did you have any good conversations in the bullpen? No, no good conversations. Really? I was kind of there alone. I got there late. I drove in. So it was me alone. High stress though. I was like, this is, I got to make it through this. <laughs> Did you have any good conversations in the bullpen? <clears throat> yeah, I had great conversations. I kept getting in trouble for being too close to other people. Maybe like <laughs> space it out. But then, no, the I second time that. I got tested, because they would open the second door, you know, and then they would call someone's name and like get it over. And then all of a sudden for me, when I was coming out, the, the lady was like came out, looked at the ticket, and then she walked down the stairs and into the corral. And I was like, oh, I'm done. Like, they're, yeah. they're going to bring me in and ask me a bunch more questions or kick me out and it was like you start looking for like an exit strategy you're like should i run how do i and then no i another negative i got like 10 mm. negative results that's what you want you in want like negative. two weeks you don't want positives dan no 2021 is the year to be negative yeah well, and 2020 was well i don't think that were they testing in 2020 oh, i got tested in 2020 you never got tested no no yeah. tests oh well, i started getting tested in i think june it was mm. my first test what was your first test uh, I, I did one earlier in the summer just before visiting some relatives, but then, yeah, the X Games was the heavy one. Like, we haven't done any other events, and I've just been trying to lay low, play it safe, but it's, I mean, have you done the nose one, the, all, all the way oh, up the, the nose? Oh, the brain tickler. I did not like that. That was that was not what I would like no, to they, do. No, they open the thing, and it looks like a, a toilet bowl cleaner. <laughs> And then it literally you got goes, a little Clorox on the, the end. They're wiping that thing. Oh, clean the up first there. time I did it, I pulled out and it was just in my nose, still out another four inches. And the guy's like, come here. You should always pull and out. And then he hand. went in and he's like stuck it in even further. And oh. it was like, it's crazy because it goes up, over and down. And then it, when it comes out, because I have more nose hair than most people, I think. I got a lot of nose I hair I could too. feel that all of my nose hair had been shifted like to pull out of my face. Right. Yeah, it was hard to breathe after that. You've been hosting X Games now for three years? Yeah, I think three three or four years now doing like all the ski stuff. So commentating, what I guess they call me the ski analyst. I just read that, Ooh. an analyst. Analyst, yeah, I like, like that, that term. That's yeah, cool. I, I just like to be involved uh, after competing for so many years, like being involved with X Games still, as I'm, I'm sure you guys can speak to. It's just like the event, like you got to be at the event for some way. So it's a way for me to go every year and like be around the athletes and the competitions that I love so much. But it's high pressure. I mean, you get stressed being at the top of the pipe or the slope course, but like 
being in the booth and worried about like saying something wrong or accidentally getting so mm. so excited you cuss on live TV or something. It's high pressure in the booth. Do they still make you sign something? You gotta you gotta pay a, a fee if you if you swear. I haven't had to sign that, or at least I haven't read that far down the the he literature. Didn't he, he didn't read it. it. it was he didn't read it at all. It's there. <laughs> it's there. Me and Danny are like the unofficial hosts of X Games. We yeah. like we're there. We're just kind of doing our own thing. We got all access passes, but we're not really on TV. No, <laughs> that's kind of the way to do it. <laughs> but I mean, as you were saying, like going there and announcing it, it is that's like such a cool feeling. Like describe that of like being in there and in that pressure cooker though for so many years of actually competing, but then the chance to go and just like enjoy the event oh. and so like support your friends without the crazy pressure. Yeah. I mean, the best part of it is like, I mean, this year we couldn't do it as much with COVID. I wasn't able to interact, but like there's nothing better than going as the commentator and getting to ski the course, talk to everybody. You can go out every night. And if you, you know, you show up a little groggy the next day, you're not doing triple corks. You're just talking about triple corks. That's so a good point. it's a real plus. And I mean, I just love like, such a big fan of the sport and all my friends are still doing it that like hopefully being the guy on the mic if i get excited i explain it well hopefully i can convince you know one kid out there on the couch that isn't a skier they're a regular sport basketball kind of kid and they're like i gotta try this skiing or snowboarding thing that guy made it sound fun so that's like the dream of being on the mic at least to make it sound approachable and cool how important is it to you and i think it is right like to have voices like yourself with staying within the sport to keep it because i feel like there are times when there are people that have those jobs that necessarily probably shouldn't have those and i'm, they, I'm not saying they're, they're great at talking but like like having an ex-professional or a professional in there i don't want to call anyone ex-professionals it sounds stupid you're a professional skier you're still a professional snowboarder thank you yeah you're welcome <laughs> two-time olympic silver medalist i gotta throw it in there every time jab <laughs> When was Sean? You right? Did you you never went to the Olympics? Did you go to the Olympics? I did not go to the Olympics. Unfortunately, I didn't have the privilege. the The year that skiing got half pipe and slope style in, I blew my knee and then couldn't qualify. I like tried to make the U.S. team, but I was skiing with a blown ACL and just wasn't quite up to snuff, so didn't make the cut. But I feel like I missed out. But at the same time, I mean, I don't know. You can tell me, Daddy. I feel like. X Games is still huge. I'm sure the Olympics was a big thing, but like, what do you look back on as like the biggest moments? Like, did I miss out on much? Make me feel better. No, you you didn't miss out on anything. Okay. It's our sports, you know, it's really like, it was so centered around X Games and it's, you know, the winter. And I think Olympics, one thing it really loses is the talent pool in the sense of it's every four years. Mm. So like, you know, in those situations where you're like, oh man, I had this mess up crashed the year before blew my knee out now i can't get to go compete and it like kind of doesn't get the best of snowboarding the audience is really cool it's like a big field but now looking into this year it's like wow that's going to disappear as well so it's like sure. what's the point of going to ride in front of a huge empty stadium just when you like you don't get like all the Americans, like, or whatever country, if there's eight really good Swiss riders that should be at snowboard half pipe, but only four can go, it's like, well, do you really have the best field in the world if you don't have all eight of whatever country's best riders? I just feel like you never get the best of the best almost. You don't, you know, it's really like, I mean, you get it in that, that sense of the season where like that year, everyone's really going for it. But for us in the U.S. field of like guys snowboarding, it was like we were riding against each other all the way until February just to get four spots. Mm -hmm. So we had like a two week break. But by the time we all went to this was like Torino. I mean, we were all like nursing injuries, like my yeah. hip was all like blown out and sore and like everyone's just getting all this work done because it was like you just battled it out for these four spots. You're and now battling it's like, each other. All right. Now go do it for the U.S. You're uh. like, OK. <laughs> So you grew up in Pennsylvania. That's right. Pittsburgh. Pit Pittsburgh. Yeah. There's no mountains. Is there mountains? What are the mountains like around <laughs> There's there? There's not a lot of mountains. No, that's, that's I, it's pretty strange. We got Seven Springs, which is like an hour east of me, and then Wisp Mountain in Maryland. So I grew up skiing those two, and they're not big. I'd say like 500, 600 vertical feet, a lot of man-made snow, but like it was a big enough hill to learn how to slide. And then they, when they started making terrain parks, I just fell in love with that. So you don't need like, you know, a massive resort to, to do rail skiing or rail snowboarding or jumps and stuff. You just need a good train park. And 
hopefully not too much rain. We used to get a lot of rain, but uh, it was a fun place to learn. I, you know, did your family grow up skiing? Uh, yeah, both my parents skied for fun. I don't think they were like big time skiers. They didn't like travel out west to ski or like they loved it. They just loved any activity, whether it was running, skiing, kayaking, biking, any outdoor sport. They just were really active people. And then I don't know why I fell in love with skiing, like why living in basically in Pittsburgh, hours away from the mountains, going on the weekends. I don't know why, but I loved it. The speed, the something about it catching air the freedom i just wasn't like a individual sport kid like i think i missed enough shots in the basketball team match where i was like i suck at all of these sports and then something about like skiing and action sports like you don't you don't have to rely on other people no one relies on you it's just you and like the individual nature of it i like fell in love and never looked back who were your like first influences around that time Ah, it's tough. I mean, when I was growing up, like everybody at the resort that was like doing, you know, skiing better or skiing faster than me influenced me. And as soon as I got my hands on like a ski movie, it's when I saw like pros. I saw like Tanner Hall and Candide Thovex and Pep Fujas and Dave Crichton and all these guys that like, when I saw like a movie of skiing, I was like, whoa, they do corks. They're doing like, it was basically when they were doing snowboard tricks. So taking all the stuff, the corks and the grabs. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know, you know, skiers were also doing like this freestyle stuff. And I just like, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I lived in uh, uh, Steamboat Springs. Uh, that's where Pep lived as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've known no Pep way. a long time. He's a huge influence of mine. I mean, from going from park kid to like backcountry and like progressing like switch landings, which is like something I still to this day try to land backwards in PAL. And he was like the first guy doing that and really pushing it and still watch some of those videos for inspiration before heading out in the backcountry. And then what was the competitive scene like for you as a kid? Like what was what was happening around Pittsburgh? Not a lot. I mean, I guess there was actually what we had was a lot of rail jams. So something in skiing and snowboarding that I don't think exists as much anymore. Like I would travel around the East Coast to like do these rail events where it'd be like, you know, an hour long, half hour long jam session. You're trying your craziest rail tricks and you win like a gift card to the local ski shop or a couple hundred bucks. And it was like that was the scene was doing doing rail jams and hopefully they can make a comeback because i that was such a cool spot like part of east coast riding i mean he grew up in new jersey it really wasn't much different right no yeah. i mean yeah for us like we were a little bit i think luckier at that time just because the usasa was kind of like the amateur snowboard scene mm -hmm. which we, we had the mid-atlantic series so i got to go to seven springs uh, a few times and I remember loving it because they had a rope toe. Oh yeah. The rope toe like next Santa's to the park was just park. like whoa this is so cool. I don't even have to unstrap. I literally get down grab this thing burn my hands oh, <laughs> until I finally get a grip. Whoa, bring then, a like, couple of gloves. Jump forward but like you know it was all about like he said you know we were really like the fun part about that am scene was like the raffles or yeah. something at the end you know where it was like you'd win like a backpack or oh, a beanie i love the raffles and i loved it too the one of the cool <laughs> things was like being like in a 12 and under age group and there's only two kids in your class in your group you know so you're like all right i'm gonna well, get guaranteed see. a prize you're like all right i'm gonna they get usually first give a prize in the top three right yeah yeah, man, those gift baskets were huge. And, and yeah. the rope toes, like, that's fast. Like, something I miss out west is, like, rope toe or handle toe. Like, for learning, like, you don't want to do a full lap to come back to try that trick you just fell on. Like, if you can do it immediately like you can on the East Coast, like, you can learn pretty quick. It's a it's a real asset. Are you a firm believer of, uh, you know, because of the way growing up skiing on the East Coast, because it's hotter, it's icy, the conditions suck, that it's an easier transition to, like, come out west and make that? transition I, or no I, I wouldn't say it like makes people i mean the age old thing is like oh you're a gnarlier or a sicker shredder if you come from the ice coast but like more than anything i think what it does is you come to the west and you are so unspoiled that like if you grow up in new jersey and pennsylvania every day is a good day even if it's raining or sleeting if it is even overcast in Utah, I'm like, ugh, maybe I shouldn't go out today. It's not Bluebird Pal Day. You like get so spoiled that yep. like growing up on the East Coast, you learn to like any day you appreciate, no matter what it's like out. Cause like you just gotta do it. It might not ever be good. 
Yeah, no, it's totally true. And it's like ice is a normal thing on the East Coast, you know, so where West Coast riding, one thing that I think really opened our eyes to like progression was like coming from the East. It was like spring lasted like maybe two weeks. Yeah. And it was like it would get warm, get fun to like try stuff. But then everything was gone and you're riding over dirt, you know. And like our mammoth days didn't go. It was like, I mean, it would snow two feet and then two days later it'd be 50 degrees. Yeah, that's true. It's just gorgeous. Like, yeah, mammoth in the spring too. You ride till June. Like, I don't know. When did Mountain Creek close? March? Like, it, it, sometimes it's more about like, when do they even open? You yeah, know, it's like true. they open hopefully by Christmas and then yeah, close by like March. Yeah, 1st. let's just, we'll round it up and say East Coasters are cooler and gnarlier and better. That's what I was trying to get at. Why <laughs> yeah. you just agree with me when I nailed it? Yeah, to you? We why'd we have to you. go around the block? Why are we going around in circles here? <laughs> um, the Super Unknown video series, that was kind of where you got discovered. Yeah. Me and Danny, we like to do research. We're big research guys, you know. <laughs> Danny researchers. likes to get on the YouTube and, and, some of your videos have crazy amount of views. Yeah. Like millions and millions of views. Yeah, I saw one with 5 million views. That's and you insane. think like that that, that, that that video series, how did that help you? Or how did that even come about? Like, cause that's been a thing that obviously pushing content out and pushing content in a way that you know to, um, you've obviously cornered, not cornered the market. You know what you're doing there. Do you think that helped out as a kid? Like, yeah, I think more than anything, that contest was like, so unique in that it was like a first video contest before Instagram and YouTube was even a thing. They were doing this video contest and growing up in PA, like I had no chance to go compete at the U S open in Vail or, or like I just couldn't get to these like things to show off skills. So to be able to put together video to show off your skills was like the coolest idea. And then making that video and just like hitting the scene right when like YouTube and like online content started happening was like, that's how I became a pro skier. Thanks to that video and all the videos, like that era of like 05, 06, where it was like, oh, you can actually like showcase your skiing other than a contest and other than like a ski movie, like a yearly release, you can just put out a video on the internet and then like showcase it to kids and maybe even sell products to kids that way it was like, I just hit the scene at the right time and I don't know, that's just always what I've loved is the video making and a couple of those have a lot of views somehow. I don't know, people seem to like watching it. Yeah, well, you're pretty good at what you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you made that video at that time, like were, who was helping you film it and like put it all together? Yeah, so I had just, when we made that video, I had just moved out west from Pennsylvania, moved to go to school at the University of Utah. I wasn't a pro skier. I was going to school for business. I wanted to get my degree and ski as much as possible and see where it could take me. And we, me and this crew called the 4 by 9 crew, just started making videos for fun. And we just skied all that year and going from Weekend Warrior, Seven Springs and like Wisp on the East Coast to like, five days a week, two class, like I had two days of classes that I was skipping a little bit. So I was skiing like a lot out West. And I just like went from knowing how to ski and do some tricks to like learning everything in one year. Wait, had that video come out when you were living on the East coast? That video came out when you moved to Park City, you moved to Utah. First year in Utah. First year in Utah. Yeah. And you went, you were studying finance? Uh, yeah, like a little bit. I did business administration. So I did like a little accounting, a little finance, a little marketing, a little bit of everything. Did you graduate college? <laughs> yeah, I, I graduated. It's kind of a, a Van Wilder kind of look. It took me 12 years. But I do now officially have my undergrad in business administration. No way, 12 years. Uh, with a seven year hiatus for all those watching. So it's not like I'm that stupid. I took seven years off, but uh, yeah, should. I finally got it. I didn't graduate high school. Danny's back in college right now. Whoa. Yeah, I'm actually just started college like two or three years ago. And I'm just like three classes away from my associate arts degree. Where are you going? Uh, I'm in this school, St. John's River State College down in St. Augustine, Florida. Very cool. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, during the winter, I've kind of just kind of focused more to all online class. But one thing I thought that was really cool that you mentioned that I think a lot of people don't see as kids thinking about like college as like a path to continue to do other things. But you only have to go to class like two or three days a week. Dude, the first year. So it's I like, moved, what? Yeah. I have like all this time and then like one day a week, the homework's due. Yeah. Like the first year I moved to Utah, I, I scheduled them all on two days a week. One of my classes, I think, was World of Dinosaurs. It was like oh, I, I had, that class. I had oh. an elective, like 
you kidding me? World of dinosaurs? Like I, I was skiing so much and like that was not a hard class. Like easy to learn about Triceratops. Let's go. What did your parents think about when you started not going to school and starting skiing more? Uh, I think my mom was all about it. My dad was not so much about it. He uh, He's a hardworking lawyer by trade and like started his own little firm. And he wanted me to go to school and didn't really at first see the future, I think, in skiing because it wasn't like there weren't Olympics. There wasn't there wasn't a path to getting paid. It, it just was like a thing that people kind of did. But my mom was always like, oh, yeah, just skip school or we'll help you pay rent this month and go skiing, like follow your dreams. And eventually my dad came around once the, the checks started coming in. He was like, OK, I get it. So you pick University of Utah. You know you're going there to ski. Mm -hmm. You tell them you're going there to go to school. <laughs> they know there's mountains there, but in your head, you you had that plan all along, right? Oh yeah, I mean the plan was I even went with friends from the East Coast. We were all in a, a dorm room and suite together, and it was like we're going to go to school because we know college is like the next step. But like, how do we make skiing a bigger part of our life and and still be allowed to like go out west? And then so that year you just powered, have your boys, have your crew, you're filming every day. You enter, was it a competition? It's a competition you entered, huh? Yeah, it's like a video competition. So you film a video and then in like February you submit your best video and then they judge it based on the tricks and the technicality and like how good you would be in the, the end goal of the contest is you win like maybe some sponsorships and you get a chance to film with that company. And it was like at the time, the company you would want to film with so it was like my foray or like entrance into like ski like mainstream ski culture and you had no sponsors before that no i guess i mean i was getting like free product i wasn't getting paid for sure by anybody it was like oh here's some skis oh your skis are beat up maybe we'll replace the one ski that broke with one and then i'm skiing like two different skis it was like i was getting free gear but it wasn't like, I was not a professional. Two skis, that's pretty savage. <laughs> Two different skis. Yeah, I mean, they'd be the same model, but like if I only broke one, the company I was on at the time would, would replace that one for me, but it wasn't like you get a whole new set. <laughs> I remember one time I had different tires on my car and the car guy was like, Dingo, this is like basically having a Reebok and, a, and an Adidas on at the same time. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So, it, I mean, if it works, it works. I mean, it drove. <laughs> If you're not driving to the mountains, maybe you're okay. So 2012 was kind of your breakout year on the contest scene? Yeah, that was the big year. I would say I broke out maybe in 2010 or 11 with some like wins like at some contest. But 2012 was like the year that I was like, holy shit. Like I'm actually pretty dope at this, I you, guess. You won X Games? <laughs> won X Games you won in Mountain Aspen. Dew? Do tour the whole thing, the overall do cup. Right. And then Euro X Games, second. Yep. What yeah. happened there? I don't know. <laughs> Slight bobble. I was Who going. Beat you? Who I beat you? Uh, that year, let's see, it was 2012, Bobby Brown. Oh, Bobby's good. Bobby's really good. I, to be honest, I had a little bit of a ski pop up in the landing. It wasn't perfect. So, you know, second, I guess I'll have to take it. <laughs> Let's go back to that year, though. I wish I could go back in time and relive that. That was fun. Oh, if we could go back, what year would we go to? Um, oh, six? So many good years. Oh, six was a good year. Oh, six was a good year. 2006 Olympics. Italy. I mean. I had the best time. He, I, got, he got second, but I, I had imagine. the best time. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, we had so many good years. It's hard to, like, pick one. But for me, I had, like, a similar breakout year, I think, at 19, when I was 19. So it was probably about... 2001 season and it was cool because it's like like you're saying where you've been competing kind of in the scene but all of a sudden it's like something clicks in you mm -hmm. where it's like you start feeling it and then it was almost like other people just start standing still or yeah their progression like, kind of stays still and all of a sudden it's like just find Whoa. something it's such a cool moment too when you feel that or you like you feel good on your board or skis like you finally like go into events with confidence i realize like when you go in thinking you can win and that you should win and like you're looking forward to an event rather than like being like oh i hope i can finally land a run when you're like oh yeah i gotta run for this event like that is a cool feeling yeah 
You were 2010 and 12 free skier, skier of the year. Yeah. And then you've got some rider polls, 2011, 2012. People really like you. That's what we noticed is that like everyone really likes you. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I feel like... Uh... <laughs> What's the secret? <laughs> what are you doing? What? We want to know. People want to know. I don't know. Shelling out cash to the right people? No, I don't know. I guess I think why I always like won these rider polls or like fan favorite things in the past was like I didn't come up in skiing through like the contest i wasn't like the kid that like did events grew up like out west in a program and like seemed privileged like i came from the east coast i grew up making videos my story was relatable to a lot of the ski fans out there i think and then for some reason people just like relate to that i think they they love to see like not to say i was an underdog but they love to see someone like more like themselves like seeing somebody come up from a small resort and then make it through this and into the X Games finally after like years of having cool videos, it seemed like a more approachable like way to get into skiing or into like the top level events. And I don't know, it resonated with people. So uh, you've become the man in skiing at this point. <laughs> When did you start the Wellis Project, your, your film company? When did that all come about? Like, when did that pop into your head? I guess, so I've been obviously making films for a long time, yep. and we did it with different production companies, and I loved every aspect of ski filming, but then I was realizing that, like, I wasn't obviously the one in charge, and we were going on trips, and I was being told where to go or where the snow was good, and I, like, realized I love to be like you guys, like a little bit more involved in like where you're going, what the shot's gonna look like, where you're gonna put the video out on the internet. And I just like, I wanted to start my own thing or at least be involved with it. So that first year we did the Wallace Project, which was just like uh, a short film showcasing all my skiing in one place and basically inspired by Nyjah's Rise and Shine project, I think okay, it was. Yep. Cause he like, made a, a solo project that was short eight to ten minutes and it was just heat and i was like i want to showcase skiing in a short film with just heat just tricks just like bangers the whole thing just me and then we we did that and from there started like making ski movies adding other people and just like it was more fun to choose where we were going do what you want with the footage. Like I could own it. I could put it on Instagram. I could give it to whoever. It was more about like taking ownership of the content and like our whole production is why I started it. I feel like that's just kind of like the way the world went in general. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like back in the day, you know, from ski snowboard world, it was like you're confined by the movie production crew, the sponsors given the money to be a part of the movie. And then even the magazines, like look about look, look, where, where the industry is now with magazines of people aren't, there's not much you can touch. It's gone mm. more to online. Even things like podcasts now are getting more relevant because it's it's more in touch. It's it's more it's 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 quicker to the audience. And but but it's the way things have escalated or change. You want to take power and leadership in mm. in in most things you're doing because you want to have control of it, right? Like yeah. you don't want to not have control of your own footage. You don't want to be control of your own destiny or waiting for some company to say, Hey, like we're paying you to be in this project. Yeah. Like that was the big thing. Old ski media was like sponsors would give money to the movie company. And then I would still pay for myself to go film with the movie company. And I was like, why are the sponsors giving me money to help me get on these trips? And then when we took ownership, it was more like, Oh, Hey, like monster energy helped us film this project. Here's all the footage. You don't have to also go buy it from the film company. Like we filmed it for you. It's all yours. You want all the best footage of me for this year? You already own it because you sponsored our film. And it was just like, it gave me a more direct route to like work with the brands and companies that support me and that I like. Even the way you kind of broke into the industry with your original film, you just mm -hmm. went and did it yourself. There was a competition. You went, you won, then boom, it's kind of like starts this trajectory from 2007 fast forward five years and you've won how many x games how many do to us how many you know awards and it's like you did that all on your own yeah it, i guess so now you're starting to make me blush over yeah here. and i mean and i think a big part of the reason why the fans are so into it is that you were having fun while you were doing it it wasn't like you did it to keep getting results or True. you know to follow the footsteps in your classic father's race icon you know it was like no this is like my thing this is what i'm gonna do and it is like for me competitions were always fun but man i something about filmmaking and filming ski videos is just so cool like you can 
try a trick a hundred times. It's not about just doing one run. It's like, oh, I've got a dream for a rail or for a trick I want to do. Like it might take hours, but I can just keep trying it. And if I get it on film, like that's a moment like people for, I, I think people forget about some contest results because there's always a new contest, but like some film shots or particular tricks that are captured on film will last decades. And that's what's so impactful, I think, about media. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk <laughs> about trying to trick a hundred times in a day and mm -hmm. not getting it. Oh, gosh. So <laughs> that you you had you built the world record. You, you, you have the world record for the longest rail slide. Yes. You built it with snowpark technology, yep. right? Correct. How long was this rail? So yeah, Snowpark Tech came to Seven Springs, one of the resorts I grew up skiing at, and we built a 440 foot long rail. So, wow, <laughs> how many stairs would that be to the lame man? You think? Uh, let's say, I mean, what a foot of stair, maybe. Okay, so, so it's like a four, four to five hundred stair rail. Yeah. Or a 500 stair rail. So, and to put it into perspective too, we always thought about it in terms of like a football field. So, a football field's 100 yards, about 300 feet. So, like a football field and a half. So, like imagine a stadium, and it's like probably the length of the whole stadium and the football field included. So, basically, <laughs> you could have had you're like the grunk, and Brady would be at the top of the rail. All right, Brady's and at the Brady top. And Brady could almost throw the ball. Could Brady throw the ball to Gronk at the bottom of the rail? To, to Walsh at yeah, the bottom. I don't know. We're going to have to confirm with Brady on this. We'll have to get him on. But I we'll don't know. Brady That's on. pretty far toss. Even, I, I mean, guess you could catch age, it like three quarters of the way and then slide <laughs> the rest sliding. of it. So uh, the setup that you built for that. So I saw that the one day you did that you didn't get it, you said you tried it over 100 times that day. Yeah. What is going through your mind after you're like a hundred goes into something? You're like, hmm, maybe, maybe today's not the day. It was, it was bad. It actually took five full days. And I'll tell you like the first or second day. Yeah. I ended up doing over a hundred. And the most depressing thing about it is the way it's set up, the rail's really long and I'm getting a snowmobile lap. So I'm sitting on a snowmobile to get taken back up, but to get to where the snowmobile picks me up, I have to ski past the whole rail. So every time you come off early, you have 300 feet of rail that I ski next to, and it's just staring at you like, You're like, yeah, you, okay, dude. so I got to make it here, and yeah. then I got to make it to here. And then, holy crap, this is a long rail. Every time. And it was absolutely depressing. I mean, at first... It went for like five days. First day I had friends, family, uh, the whole crew there. Everybody cheered me on. Felt like it was going to happen. By day five, it was like three filmers. My like girlfriend was gone. My agent's gone. Everybody had to leave because we were there for like two weeks yeah. waiting on sun and That's waiting life. on build. And it was like, everybody was like, I don't know if he's going to get it. <laughs> At that point, how many times did you want to give up? I mean, I wanted to give up a lot. Every day where I didn't get it was like, we'd go back to the hotel, we'd have dinner, have a few beers and be like, it was like really sad because like, it's quiet. if I don't get it, we built this thing. It's like $12,000 worth of steel alone. All the people that worked on it, we had plans for it to be a half hour TV show on World of X Games. Like if I don't get it, the Guinness Book of World Records guy came out. Like we had to pay for him to fly down and analyze this thing. Like if I don't get it, it's all been for absolutely nothing. And Just you had a to waste keep him there, right? Uh, we didn't have to keep him there. He came, he made sure the rail was legit. He filmed for a day with us. And then we were able to submit video proof afterwards. But we had to put oh. like- Oh, okay, that's good. Cause I was worried like, what if he goes to the bathroom and then you <laughs> land it? And he's like, well, I didn't see it. No, he, yeah. he wasn't watching. Luckily, he just had to verify the like the measurements. Distance. And we had like a scale on the rail. So for video, it's like 20 feet of it was measured with numbers. So then in video, they can analyze it and verify the legitimacy of where I landed on the rail, how long the rail is. And it's like oh. all this Guinness book requirements. Yeah, because um, what, what was the world record before you had this idea? I think it was, was there like, a world record. There was, there was. It was like two hundred and forty feet. Who so had that far? I forget the kid's name actually. Well, no one knows his name anymore. Oh, oh man, just kidding. Oh, Scrubbed wow. out. Wow, he's gone. He's gone. Uh, but yeah, it is. We we made it extra long because a kid in Norway had unofficially broken it and did like three hundred and sixty some. So a long one, but it wasn't official. But I couldn't not beat that one. So we made ours like. 
far and above 440 some and the steel comes in 40 foot sections so we just like arbitrarily made it that and just went for the gold <laughs> what happened with the steel afterwards they just chopped it up and like sold it to other people or left it at the mountain yeah they let they they have it all at the resort so they chopped it up and they've used it for like whatever 50 different rails since then and they they made a ton of rails for the whole local crew and skiers locally to, to ride from then on that's pretty cool yeah. did you uh you keep a piece of that rail I, I don't have a piece. My mom has a piece of it that, uh, cool. that she that she keeps. She's got a little bit of everything. She's got all the memorabilia. That's so <laughs> rad. So uh, we're cruising along, and basically uh, 2013 is when you got a pretty big injury. Yeah, that's that knee injury. I tore my left ACL getting ready for the Olympics. And at the time, it's coming off that 2012 season we talked about. We can where, push this table closer. Oh. Pull it up. Oh, get relax, comfy, man. relax. Like, we're here. We're, yeah, we're in it. <laughs> it's these Dan, old knees. Okay, sorry. These old knees. Two uh, yeah. two surgeries on each, and I'm running low. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Dan. Put your feet up. <laughs> I've got a left. I got a new left ACL also. <laughs> Ooh, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Is it, that it, the first ACL surgery of yours, or have you done it before? No, just one. But then, uh, actually, like a few years after that, I built this little jump at Mount Hood. Uh -huh. And it was on one of the ravine sides. Yep. And I finally landed this trick and I snowboarded just airing through moguls down. And then it was like a crevasse that melted out. Oh. And I just shot straight to like uphill, dirty snow. And then I, I fractured my tibia plateau. Oh. But you went through knee. most of your and career without getting ACL. hurt in the beginning, right? Yeah. I mean, just minor injuries, some shoulder stuff here and there. It's you know. so lucky. And that was your first major injury? Yeah, yeah. Same thing. I mean, I made it so far and felt like I was invincible. And then, I mean, shoulders or knees, if you do it, it's not like painful. It's not like you can't do anything. It's like, oh, I can't do the sport I love, though. But, like, the ACL wasn't, like, painful. I was just like, dang it. Like, now my leg is, like, all whoopy. But, like, I could still kind of ski, but not really. And were you prepping for the Olympics that year? Yeah, I was... <laughs> in New Zealand training for the Olympics, coming off that 2012 season where I won almost everything. I felt so amazing. I was like, oh, Olympics gonna be easy, or not easy, but like, I'm a favorite, I could do this. And then I just exploded my knee while training, tried to compete on a torn ACL, but like, I just couldn't ski well. I was all awkward and in pain and just couldn't make it happen, so. So you missed Dreams are going for 2014 and then 2018 was just out of the question? Yeah, I guess I kind of just decided it wasn't for me. In like 2015, the year after the Olympics, I came back from the ACL and I was competing, but finding myself not loving it. I was daydreaming about like the next film trip or what we had planned afterward. And I was like, I just don't like love this anymore. And if I don't love it, I don't want to be the guy going to the X Games to get eighth and taking that spot away from some kid that like me when I was a kid, I would have given anything to compete there. And if I don't absolutely love it, like why go and do it? So that final year in 2015, I was like, I'm done. Somebody else deserves to be like here, giving it their all. And I was like, I'm going to focus all on film. Cause that's like where I have the most fun and where I think my future will be. Right. And then when in your head, did you start thinking about like announcing or media or like, was that ever a thought in your head? Like when you were in the middle of like competing or just, slipped in later i don't know it's just sort of slipped in i guess i never really thought about like yeah working and the, any of the tv stuff or doing commentating i just knew i love skiing and after a year i think of watching events not competing i saw like the announcers maybe call uh, a 720 a 1080 and get something wrong and it frustrated me i was like why can't he just like call the tricks right at least like it's bare minimum it's so easy i could do that and then somehow i ended up like oh I guess they actually would let me do that. I guess I got to try now. And to this day, I've even got things wrong. And I'm like, it's not as easy as it looks. You learn right yeah. away. But that's what I was going to say is like looking at like the progression of it. Right. It's like you're calling these tricks and it is getting complicated. Dude, there's like 1800s and 1980s now. Yeah, there's like watching the big much. airs at X Games this year was like, whoa. I mean, so many spins, it's impossible to count. So I get it. But I always just wanted the announcer to do a better job of like, not only getting it right for the core fans, but also explaining it in a fun and unique way to the mm -hmm. average Midwest mom who is going to be the one that lets her kid go to summer camp for skiing or move to Utah to go to school. Like, 
if you make it fun and approachable for that person, you get that many more kids into the sport in sort of that process. Where does it go from now? Like when does the, is there a peak of like where the level stops or like where does it stop? Our, the thing we've been joking about is when is somebody going to spin into the future? So our call is mm -hmm. that if you spin more than 2020, so if you do a 2160, will you basically disappear, disappear yeah like, like in the delorean mm -hmm. back to the future but I'm mind, I'm into mind the blown future. right now it's sort of like Spin inception matrix combined you know i've seen spin. you know i've seen inception probably 50 times and i still don't know what they're doing in that movie <laughs> does the dreidel yeah. or what do you call it the little spindle thing at the end does it ever fall yeah I don't think is he so. in the dream or i whatever? think he's in the dream that's why i i kind of stopped <laughs> around the, like 1080s i'm trying to just like spin into the past you there know you like go. bill and ted I'm more of like the Bill and Ted kind of version. Like, I don't want to spin all the way into the future. And then all of a sudden it's like you end up and. I know. I wish we could just get in a phone booth and go back to 2006. It seems so much safer. Tell then. everyone to start wearing masks. Yeah, there yeah you or go. go back to 1080 in like AD and just like invent snowboarding or Ooh. skiing. You know, you're like, it's all right, guys, be, check this out. It's going to be hard. Maybe we could make a rope toe back in 1080. <laughs> We get that, can we get a rope toe going in 1080? Like a pulley system, oh, right? Oh, yeah, ox. You just straight just put the rope on a tree and then send Using the ox, ox down the hill. Yeah. And Are we going to be able to build a half pipe? Eh, that might be tough. Hand oh. built? You're not going to be getting a Zog going in 1080. No, but then we won't have to worry about these 22-foot walls as much. That's true. You know? I don't know how much further it could go, though. How many? We saw 1980s in skiing. I saw, like, everybody do an 1800 in snowboard big air this year at X Games. Like, mm -hmm. how, I, can they spin anymore? I certainly will never do an 1800. You can quote me on that. I mean, I guess it's just, but then the jump's got to get a little bigger, right? Yeah. A little bigger, a little poppier. But at one point, does it almost get into, like, aerials? Where? It's starting to look like aerials a little bit. Or, I liked aerials growing up, though. I just didn't like too. that they, like, I, I wish they had poles. Yeah. I was always, like, even when, like, I, I like, do you, do you, are you a, are you a pole guy or a I'm, no pole guy? I'm a pole guy for the most part. Right. I don't know. I just ski more backcountry now, and it really helps you, like, navigate your way down some steep or pillows or something where you can kind of, like, Poke balance and see your... see what's under there, yeah. too, right, a little bit. I, I, I mean, they're just, like... I don't know. I don't love them, but you don't need them for the park for sure. Like when you're doing like tricks, no. like what do you use them for? I'm not pole planting on my way down the half pipe. That's Let's hope for not. sure. Let's hope not, right? They just get in the way. Make yeah, it harder okay. to grab maybe. <laughs> Man, you did, um, you raised some money for MS, hey? Yeah. You walked five <laughs> kilometers in ski boots? Yeah, that's a funny story. Good research over here. Uh, actually, yeah, I did. An MS charity walk in Salt Lake years ago, my aunt has MS and it's always been something she's passionate about working for the MS society and doing fundraisers with them. And growing up, we always did the walks every year. We would walk the 5k donate money. And it was like a family activity that got us all together and outside. And then I thought it'd be fun to do something different and have like a conversation starter. So I wore my ski boots and then did the whole walk with her in Salt Lake. And it was just like, one of those things where it just like everybody's asking me because they're like what the hell is this kid doing like why is he mm -hmm. got ski boots on it's like september it's like warm out and it was more like to kind of show how even something as simple as walking can be a challenge for somebody dealing with ms and walking in ski boots as they're not snowboard boots they're not comfortable no they they're, are... they're a lot harder and they go clink clonk clink clonk <laughs> but it just like was fun to kind of to show that, you know, everybody's dealing with something and it can be hard just to get up and walk, but how much it means. And it was just a fun thing to do. So that's cool. Did it, you get blisters? That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Is there a photo of your feet after this? Yeah. Did or? you, did you smell your feet afterwards? Uh, I didn't smell them. They were probably not that, that not smelling good, but no blisters really. I mean, I walk a lot in my ski boots, but they were, it's September. It was like 75 degrees and ski boots are warm. So I was sweating. Those were little... And you didn't smell your socks. I love smelling my socks after like a big day. I do too. Just, I, I just, just think, oh, like, yeah. Ooh. Is that weird? And yeah. even though you know your boots already smell, so it just yeah. has the same I stinky I love smell. It. I, love boots. Boots. <laughs> I love boots. I love smelling my boots. Okay, guys, podcast like has been fun. I got to get out of here. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's kind of gross, man. I haven't changed the soles in my snowboard boots in like eight years, nine oh. years. See, I'm the kind of guy that puts dryer sheets in his ski boots and dries them every day, trying to keep them from smelling. They still smell, but I mean, my wife would kill me if I wasn't doing all these things because 
Right. I'm definitely Maybe not smelling not them married. afterward. <laughs> no, well, yeah, there's a few reasons we're not married. <laughs> but I don't think it's because we, we smell our socks after so. snowboarding. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah. We got to look into that. We'll all ask Do some investigation. Yeah. Come back. You're pretty savage. You're savage in the streets, which there's not that many skiers in the streets. I know it's, it, it is popular, but you're one of the leaders out there. Like, do you think that's because where you grew up that you like have maintained like level in the streets? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think growing up in Pennsylvania and like rail specifically, like I love rail skiing and I know it's not a major aspect of skiing, but for me, it was always like what I had access to. So it's what I still love doing. And I think in snowboarding, there's way more of a scene and sponsors care about like street riding. Cause like rails and skateboarding are so cool. And then urban riding and snowboarding is like respected and kids get paid to do it. And in skiing, like if you're not a backcountry athlete or a competitor, like you don't really get paid to do urban. It's not like a big scene. So for me, I love doing it. And I'm hoping to keep bringing attention and sponsor dollars to it because it really is like the most accessible aspect of skiing. Like any kid in Minnesota can go try a handrail. You can't try powder skiing. You can't try ski touring really. Like you mm -hmm. can go try a rail and it's just like, I don't know. I love it. I mean, I don't know why I'm still doing it. I was filming this year still. Yeah, that's cool. And it's though. Like, I like it. Well, there's 33. something that feels good about not having to buy a lift ticket too. True. Right. And Danny it's like, does not like buying lift tickets. Well, not I all the time. I thought I might buy a lift ticket the other day and he was bummed. No, I was not <laughs> He's in bummed. Vail though. I get why you don't want to like, buy right. a lift ticket in Vail. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody could afford that. No, it's, it's getting absurd a little bit. It's like 180 bucks a day, right? 200 something, that's isn't it? Crazy. Yeah, I think it's like 225. That's that Vail tax, eh? See, but I think think about it all summer long i golf a lot and i'll pay 180 bucks to go to some really nice golf course and i don't think anything of it because yeah I, but Are i you, would never pay to go for a day ticket like i just would you ever play golf in the streets street golf wow urban golf that urban would, golf maybe that's a market i might have to try it'd be more like yeah just around your neighborhood you just chip yeah. from house to house or something yeah we did it as kids when happy gilmore came out uh, i was in like eighth grade and like all of a sudden me and my friends became golfers oh so we dug a little hole put a tin cup in there and golfed up the yard did you see adam sailor's back golfing do you see the video he put out he, no. he's, he's swinging it again. He's swinging it Is again. Is he yeah. running and swinging? Is oh, he still yeah. got the boots on? He's got it. Has he got the hockey jersey on? I don't think he's got the jersey he on. He needs no. the hockey jersey on. <laughs> that's, that, that's him and he's peak. Uh, what about, uh, let's talk about good company films. Yeah. What's going on there? Uh, yeah, so that's the, the film company I started and own. So we kind of talked about it, but going from like filming with all these other productions, I wanted to, to do my own thing. So... We started our own thing and I don't know, the term good company just kept coming up because we were, it's just like me and then whoever, whoever's around that's my friend, whoever's filming with us, whoever's skiing that day might be featured. It's not, it's really the definition of like good company, like who you're with instead of being like who the sponsors want you to film with or who's the next it rider. Like if you don't know them, we don't film with them. Like we're just about like good, people and and who's around who's our friends and to this day we're making short films a variety of different stuff doing some production work but it's really just uh yeah like a tiny little ski film company so anybody out there listening you know if you if you want to check it out please do i like yeah. that submit a video right oh yeah like you i'm may gonna submit be a video. in the next one i'm gonna submit. dingo's actually a really good skier i got my skis in the car actually yeah i had to i did have to do a ski trip once to uh i went to deer valley and i had to ski yeah so i ended up just getting a ski instructor i was like all right i guess i'm just gonna get this so i got a ski instructor for two days and i just said dude i want to go as fast as i possibly can he got you so got for it? two days i was just tucking you could <laughs> catch me tucking on deer valley and when i crashed i ate shit oh. like just complete complete yard sale one ski up there, one ski down there, one ski pole up there, one ski goggles over there, beanie. Like I, I like I hadn't I hadn't I ain't gone that fast on snow in a long, oh long boy. time. And that's one thing you forget. Like on a snowboard, you can go as fast as possible. But when you go, your body's together. When mm. you crash in skis, it's like wakeboarding. I hate it's 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 it's, it's like when you wakeboard and you hit the ocean, when you hit the water and your arms get pulled in like weird ways, mm. you're just going weird ways. 
That's what skiing's like. Skiing, when you crash, one leg's up here, one leg's behind your head, your pole, <laughs> you lose everything. On a snowboard, we don't lose everything. But, See, but with the snowboard, I, I've been snowboarding a good bit this year just for fun. And what I realized when you're going fast and you crash, at least the skis come off and you tumble. When you catch a backside edge or a heel edge and just whip your head into the ground. That's like, true. The snowboard doesn't come off. Like my skis nope. come off and then Sometimes I kind of Sometimes it tumble. comes all the way over and hits you in the head. Oh my God. Gosh, I said, I've had some crashes this year snowboarding, and it is not fun. Yeah, I guess you're right. The scorpion's not good. It's never good when the back edge hits you in the back of the head. No. That's when you know your body's folded. At Deer Valley, though, the service is so nice. Did they pick everything up for you and bring you a nice hot chocolate afterward? I mean, I feel like they, they did everything. They put your ski boots on for you over they, there, right? They, they, they feed. They feed, at dinner. They feed you. With the, like you don't even. Your hands are on the table, and they 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 speed. They wow. spoon feed you. That's why they don't let snowboarders. Hundred percent. I, I had them tricked. They didn't know. I they didn't the know. I actually talked shit on them once too. Just they like cover tattoos and stuff. I covered everything. Like like a logo I, pop out. I, co I, co I covered everything. <laughs> We were there, uh, uh, you know, it's funny. I actually did call them out because after Sage won the Olympics, they created a drink called I the Kutzenberg and uh, uh, named after Sage. And I was like, I called him out on social media. And the funny thing is, is Todd Richards told me to call them out. So I was like, whatever, Todd, you know, Todd, Todd's telling me to call him out. He's like, you got a big social, but I like, call him out. So I do this big post. That Monday morning, they had my post up in the conference room and they're all in there talking about what I had said on Instagram. I was like, all right, we won. But it is kind of whack. Like if you're uh, you are Deer Valley and you only allow skiers, you should not name a drink after a professional snowboarder that's not allowed to go snowboard there. It was that's absurd. a no-no. I couldn't believe they did it when that happened in 2014. Like I saw that come out and I was like, that is so bad. Like he can't even. I'm technically he could go go to the bar and get the drink, but he can't ride down the hill and opera with that drink. Like yeah. you can't promote somebody. Come on. Yeah. What's up with that? Like, what year is it that? It was 2014. No, I know, but I mean, why are like, there still we're resorts in 22, where snowboarders can't whatever go? year it is? Yeah, and it's like, you know, it's kind of the same thing. Everyone's having fun on the mountain. Yeah, there's just some haters it. out there. I get it. You know what I mean? Cool. More power to them. It like it's like, it, yeah, it, it is weird to me. But there is just that culture, you know. And I think there are. Some hierarchies uh, will never allow snowboarding, and they're one of them. So I'd let you guys come if I owned Deer Valley. You could come. Oh, I went and skied the shit out of it. So like, I got them back. <laughs> so wait, when I you were yeah, them. and when you were in I, in your ski gear, I want to know what kind of outerwear you were wearing. Like, were you dressing the part? No, I was wearing grenade stuff. Okay, oh, rolling so you, grenade. You yeah, were, the Osborns did. They're rolling grenade. Like we we look good. We looked like snowboarders. We set ski boots on. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> nice. Okay, at least you didn't go for the full Deer Valley fur. You, you didn't go all out on nah, it. Nah, nah. Um, so you're on some team. You're on the team of some pretty gnarly people: Gus mm. Kenworthy, Jossie Wells, Henrik. What does it take to be, um, you know, to be on a ski team with you know, Monster Energy athletes like yourselves and that and that crew? That's a heavy lineup. Very heavy lineup. No, it's a huge honor every time I think about it too. And I don't know. I mean, I guess the way I think of it too is like. We've been talking about it a lot. Just having your own style or flavor. I mean, look at Henrik. He is the guy that's competing. He's got this crazy unique style and character. Jossie, like photography and stees and unique tricks. Like Gus is just like always going huge. Everybody has like their own thing. So for me, I just picture like not only you got to be like a good, talented skier and win some events or film some video parts, but you got to be you got to be a character. You got to be interesting. You got to be like a standout kind of person. And I mean, it is a, a, a stack team and a heavy crew to be a part of. That's for sure. Yeah. Like, I think you're kind of like us. It's like, you're kind of like the nice guy, you know, okay. like people like to be around us. You know, I don't think people talk bad about us. Do they? I've never heard it. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't like listen. To, but... I like to think you guys are the, definitely the crew that I want to grab a beer with and get to know. Like, that's the crew we want. That's what that's what we're going for. That's we're the good look. company. Hey, <laughs> welcome good, to the team. Good welcome good to company. the team. Good crew. Yeah, uh, that's, that's cool. Well, Tom, we appreciate we appreciate you taking your time off to uh, come down. We're stoked that you came to the Monster HQ and we were able to play some basketball. We didn't get we didn't, we didn't get any hoops in, right? Did not make, I didn't make a single hoop. We'll get it. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that afterwards. But Danny has a bit of a lightning round. He likes to finish Ooh, with some like, uh -oh. some like, whoosh. I didn't get to practice these. He's that's, he doesn't like that. He doesn't and, like and that. And we probably sent you some when I, I changed them all up. Oh, uh oh. Okay. Okay. So here is my first question to you. 
And right first off the top of your mind, you can think about it for 10 seconds, but not even. That doesn't sound like a lightning round. Okay, so it's lightning. First thing. Three seconds, three seconds. Greatest gear of all time. Uh, Candied Thovex. Uh, your favorite place to travel and you bring Lindsey Vaughn or Bodie Miller? Uh, <laughs> I guess I'd go with Bodie Miller and go to the 06 Olympics. It sounded rowdy. Oh, yeah. Dang. Uh, best food you found on the planet? Oh, I mean, every year in Aspen, the sushi is really good at celebrating and eating at X Games. But the sushi. Yeah, Matsuhisu or uh, Kenichi. Kenichi. A lot of good sushi. I mean, they fly it in daily, I think. I don't know. That's what they tell us. You know, that's what they say. <laughs> I've been eating a lot of mountain <laughs> mountain mussels and oysters this season. It's kind of oh. weird. I got food poisoning from Ashton this summer from an oyster. Oh, yeah. Well, no, no more oysters for me. Food poisoning or COVID, one or the other. Yeah, or a <laughs> bottle of booze. What is your most treasured possession? Your house is on fire. What do you grab? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I don't know. Pets my wife. <laughs> Okay, the wife. Perfect. That's a good one. Good Pets answer. are out. <laughs> Pets are out of the house, I mean. Not... Oh, okay. 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 Uh, your favorite go-to trick on a big jump? Oh, cork seven tail all day. Um, where would you go on a trip with Glenn Plake? Oh, man. Somewhere in the Midwest so we could ski some moguls and just slam beers with all the local rowdy people. Sick. Would you shave a mohawk as well? Uh, if I had any hair left, I would shave a mohawk. <laughs> and where is the best place to ski? Oh, best place to ski. I mean, I love living in Utah, but one of my favorites is Whistler for... The riding from park to pal to summer glacier access. There's mm -hmm. a lot going on up there. Yeah, I feel the same way. I did get to go to some uh, summer camps at oh. 16 there, and it was like the coolest thing ever. It's just the best. Summer camps, the village, the scene, the winter. Uh, everything's good up there. Cool. Well, you've answered all of those questions correctly. How'd I score? Oh, uh, That correctly. was a 99. <laughs> 99? Yeah, 99. Okay, that's not bad. Well, that's not I, bad. I mean, yeah. I guess he got a hundred. He got a hundred. I mean, I was the hoping he was going to like. I hope he was going to drop a little Lindsey <laughs> Lindsey Vaughn in there. Oh, that's what you wanted. Well, obviously he didn't want to go skiing with I would have. I would. I want to party with Bodie. Have Who you does party not want to party with Bodie? Uh, I have actually. When we were at the 2006 Olympics, which was kind of crazy, is we got to meet him, and you know he had like this his own ski persona going on there. He was kind of a little bit. I don't know how to describe it correctly, but I would say anti-organized sport in a weird mm. way. So it was weird because we all walked for the opening ceremonies and the snowboarders were like the last ones in the group. And then Bodie came out with us yeah. and like let the whole crew go Sick. and then like walked out with the snowboarders. And it was like, what? Yeah, Yo, he's yeah, I bet that would have been fun. I, I bet you Lindsay was at the front. Yeah, I, I don't even remember <laughs> seeing her there. I, well, I was also kind of chasing the figure skaters at that. point. Oh, too. man. Who the guys they? or the girls? Oh, <laughs> Uh, whichever would help me get closer to the girls. You want to chase an Apollo around, will you? I went, no, I, obviously he's like the fastest man on stage. He's a good looking guy. I was there just trying to catch like Michelle Kwan like any way I could. Man, that's, that's fun. Well, Tom, thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time out. Good luck with the rest of the season. Stay happy. Stay focused. Stay cool. Keep announcing you're good at it. Oh, thank you. Will do. Thanks for having me, boys. This has been a blast. Great to be at Monster HQ and uh, yeah. I hope to catch you guys out there. Let's get some laps in soon. That's right. Keep it stoked and keep it unleashed. He just came up with that. Danny just yeah. came up with that. That was a good closer. Off the top of the head. Top of the head. <laughs> well, I used the title from the show in Unleashed, but you guys will see that here. <laughs> unleashed with the Dingo and Danny. Fueled by Monster Energy.